hell then? I'm back. <laughs> I wanted to talk about a guy I saw over in uh, the Dallas Guitar Show uh, named Tom Murphy. You ever heard of him? Well, if you follow him far back enough, he's probably Irish, you know, with a name like Murphy. But actually, he lives in America these days, and uh, he's been well known in America, particularly around sort of Gibson and that sort of company, uh, for a long time. And uh, yeah, Tom was the originator of how you actually took one of these uh, guitars that's brand new and you made it an old one. In fact, he was the man. What they said, you can believe this or not, it's, it's, he told me, uh, what they said is he said, well, here's a guitar, go away and see if you can make it look old. Yeah? And here's the, the one we want you to work from, this 1959, whatever it was. So they had the meeting and off, off Tom went and then he heard nothing for months on end and then they, had, they called this meeting and they, they called Tom Murphy back and uh, in they came and they sat down they said yeah yeah okay yeah oh there's the 59 where's the one you've done and Tom Murphy said no you've got something wrong that is the one I've done and they couldn't believe it in fact they were confounded yeah, oh my God, I can't believe that's true. And it, of course it was true, as anybody who follows the likes of Gibson and one or two others these days uh, know that Tom Murphy was the man behind all of that. And I get to see uh, Tom on a stand uh, full of Gibson guitars, and uh, some of which have been modified by him. And he, he was going through uh, a, a chat, if you will, uh, telling you how he arrived at what he arrived at and how he did it and uh, it's all very interesting now I didn't get the whole chat because he went on for ages and ages but I have enough of it for you guys to watch uh, what he said or the bits that I did get and uh, it's definitely worth watching so it's just a short introduction about Tom Murphy and uh, how he worked at uh, Gibson and how he did that and all that sort of stuff it was just so interesting Anyway, until next time, he's coming up now. Get out of here. With all the guitars I own, but I bought a 1952 Fender Precision Bass in 1969 because I'd seen Vanilla Fudge and the bass player's bass headstock look like a Telecaster. A week later, one was hanging in a store and I bought it for a hundred bucks. The next summer, I traded that for an SG Junior and gave the guy $30 because I just heard live of Leeds and Townsend was playing an SG and I had to have an SG and, and it's been that way ever since and honestly I, I haven't been without an old guitar for any length of time since then except a period of time when Delta Airlines broke my 68 Les Paul in half and so I just had to play whatever guitar that I could get. I grew up in a small town in Illinois where there really weren't any guitars. I mean I heard somebody had a guitar so I could look at it. Uh, there, were, there were some teen bands at our teen center. But I moved to Houston, Texas in 1969. And imagine this. There were guitars sort of like everywhere. And I thought that's the only place that people like to buy guitars. Because we found these other guys are into it. And in the spring of 70, I sat on a tile floor in a really small club. 10 feet from the stage where Billy Gibbons and his new band, ZZ Top, were playing right there. Billy Gibbons was playing that Les Paul we heard he had gotten. And imagine all the years later, which is seven or eight years ago, when I had to reproduce that guitar in our aging thing. Just some crazy stuff was happening in my trip along the way. But, but I played guitar, lived in Colorado, I had a few guitars out there, I moved to Nashville in 1983, 
to be putting tops of Les Pauls together. But I, I did that until noon the first day and walking through the hall at lunch, uh, another friend stopped and said, oh, did they call you? Because my name was on an application, or his name was on from a long time ago, and they needed somebody in repair over at Final Assembly. So I went from the wood mill to repair, like really quick, and I sat beside this older lady who touched up little spots or scratches or buffing. That was in 89. A year later, I went into the finishing department. And one day at lunch, a guy wanted me to paint his sunburst Les Paul. And I had never painted a sunburst Les Paul, but I had these fantasies about doing that. Now, I want to go back to in the 70s in Houston. For some reason, most guitars that we would acquire, the, the finish didn't survive more than a day or two. Why we did that, I don't know, but probably some of you are guilty of the same thing. I don't know what we were looking for the wood or something. Having no way to put the finish back on a guitar. No clue. Maybe go to Walmart and buy some clear stuff to spray on it. I want to say I had no technical knowledge, experience, or plan to be a guitar technician, honestly. At some point I said, I, I shouldn't touch a guitar except to play it. But when the Gibson thing happened, I had actually gotten a stripped off Les Paul Jr. So watching the guys at Gibson actually execute putting filler on the wood and the paint inspired me to set up a thing in my garage where I would paint this guitar. The last spin of the guitar of the Junior that I thought I'd executed this finish caused the screw to come out of the butt and make the guitar hit the floor of my garage where the headstock went that way and the guitar, that was my first paint job at home. I stayed at Gibson and, and in the finishing repair department, I, I got first-hand experience spraying the guitar. We'd have to strip a whole guitar and repaint it because of some damage. Well, I also had a reputation by that point inside Gibson of going to guitar shows, having some old guitars, and one day in 91-ish, I was approached by somebody who said, hey, uh, why don't you get come with us and be part of this thing, we're gonna try this thing called Dealer Custom, where the dealer could call and request some kind of customized deviant appointment. That was an experiment at that time. Edwin Wilson, I don't know, I don't know if he's here, he and I were the first two guys that were asked to do that. Uh, we didn't know how we were going to do that because we had no equipment or we, we both had a workbench. We would acquire certain instruments that, that they couldn't use anymore at Gibson. By the time I got some kind of paint job on it, Edwin would build it out. We started traveling to this show especially and uh, the, the others with a batch of stuff we called custom shop. They had a decal on it. At the same time that was happening, I was invited to a meeting with a somewhat new plant manager at USA and a marketing guy who were trying to plan a strategy of product line for 93. And I swear, I, I just felt like some kid that was in the right place at the right time because I held my hand up and said, well, uh, if you would take the reissue less Paul and like, make some changes that are more more accurate to the vintage specs. I mean, just it's really not even anything like an old one. And these guys literally said, like, what? And they said, come next week to the meeting again, which meant all week I just wrote down these things that I wish they would change. They said one day, okay, do it. That became the historic Les Paul in 1993. So, one of the proudest moments of this whole thing is holding that guitar up at Anaheim at the NAMM show in 1993 with my peers, some of which are very, very critical, saying, wow, that's, that is cool. I mean, from the logo to the truss rod cover to the great new neck and the neck joint and the body, that was the beginnings of the historic Les Paul. That became parallel to this custom thing we were doing. So in 93, the fall, they told 
of us, which was now like four people, to go down the street, move our workbenches to a different building. They had hired a, a, someone to oversee us, and that became the Custom Historic Art Division. And they hired a general manager, and our production, we had a number higher than we had had, and I suggest that we have to have the historic. We, we must possess that here to take care of the specifics. I mean, you, you had everything from a silk screen, a logo, to a specific painting, and so on. So I was there all of 94 until early November. So uh, legend has it that I painted every guitar, every Sunburst guitar, and some of the gold tops in 1994, which is for the most part true, till November the 3rd. Okay, I left then and moved away from Tennessee to Illinois to start something to feed my family, and that became guitar preservation in a small shop in my dad's garage. Unfortunately, I had the support of guys all around the country and the world, really, calling, going, hey, man, can I send my guitar to you? And I'm thinking, like, to do what? Well, I was, at that point, most notable for painting, and I had, at that point, painted hundreds of guitars, which most repairmen never had an opportunity to do that. So I had a little spray area in, in my shop, in my dad's garage, and then I acquired these buffing machines through a friend who had surplus equipment. So guitar preservation was born. That was mostly restoration of old guitars. Ideally a neck that had been stripped or uh, sanded and I could match it to the body. Prior to that, I had taken the guitar from this show and snuck it into Gibson, and it was an old Firebird with a messed up headstock, and it was all gold, and it was all weather checked, the entire thing up to the bad repair, and I spent a month or so fixing the structural part, so when I reshot the gold on the new part, it clashed horribly, as we know. That's the first time I had taken a razor blade and tried to make lines on the new part to match what was very obvious on the old part. It was really horrible until, until I actually tried to buff it off to get rid of it, and it, and it caused it to actually look more realistic. I would say my life sort of changed at that moment because when that guitar was returned to the owner, they were like, amazing. How did you do that? And of course, I, I didn't want to admit what I had done because of the sort of artificial nature of it. That became part of what I was Im implementing in, in guitar preservation. So I, I didn't scratch up every guitar, but a lot of them needed that treatment. So I got known as this guy that could make these lines on a guitar that looked like cracks. And, and, and if and when you want to, you can. sometime and check that. That's a good example. There are others back here. That other guitar's up the table. No, not the ball. I don't want the ball. Anyway, uh, so two guys from another company stood in front of one of my guitars at this show and went, okay, now how do you do that? I said, it's done by hand. I has, uh, and they went, no way. I said, how else can I do it? And they go, you, you did all that by hand? I said, how else can I do it? And I knew then that it was impressive instead of disappointing to someone viewing it. And I didn't tell how I was doing it for fear that it would be perceived as artificial until a good friend in Nashville, a guitar builder, said, you're missing the boat. When you tell them how you're doing it, they're not going to be disappointed. So a few weeks later, at a guitar show, one of my pieces was sitting there being viewed by some Japanese buyers. And the guy said, well, there's Tom. He did it. I walked over and introduced myself and then said, yeah, I, I, I do it by hand. And immediately their reaction was like sort of amazed. And so I understand.
understood right then that that was going to be the foundation of what I was going to be doing for a living for a while. And so it, it had credibility in the, in the restoration. And I, I started like meeting with these real famous luthiers and, and repairmen who were going, what, how did you do that? And I, I guess I had some sort of art background. And, to, and then my experience with vintage guitars, I have stared at finishes on guitars for all of these years. Well, I, I knew that this was going to happen because another company had shown a new guitar that looked old in 1995. So by 1997, I realized what was going to happen. I had always still been associated with the historic Les Paul, even away from Gibson, because I, I was involved with the, the, the engineering of it. So in 97, I took my personal historic Les Paul, did all the aging treatment, including the hardware treatment, everything, and took it to Arlington, set it on a stand, and literally my life changed right then because guys went, so you can do that on a new guitar? And I went, yeah. And they said, how much? Well, I, I had about three seconds to come up with a figure. And I blurted out this number and they went, and then looks and 
says, what's all them scratches on there for? <laughs> and we said, because that's the aging thing where we try to make it look like your gold top after all those years of playing. And you know, the whole image of you with the gold top and Dwayne with the, he goes, why would somebody want it like that? That's what it got looking like. That's why I stripped it all off. Okay, well, Dickie, people think that's cool. So we just sort of rolled with it. And Dickie today, I, I got to play golf with him about a month later. He finally got it. And uh, uh, by the way, he, he had stripped his gold top off. And he had, he had stained it orange, by the way, because he said he always liked the Gretsch guitar. And put a concho for a, for a switch ring and a belt buckle for a... Anyway, uh, that, that was cool, but we did the gold top anyway. The next was Gary Rossington from uh, Leonard Skinner. We got to reproduce his personal sunburst. Jimmy Page, and then the list just goes on and on. I mean, it was just incredible. Oh, 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 oh. Is there one of them? What, what's up here? Somebody had tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, uh, well, several years from now, you're going to have to reproduce that guitar. <laughs> I would have wondered, okay, what, where will this take place? And uh, so I have had so many great, cool opportunities along the way. And I say this all the time, that my association with Gibson, even though it's just on a contractual basis, I live back in Tennessee now, by the way, I moved back five years ago, and we work very closely together. This wouldn't be the same if I did it on Acme guitars, okay? These are, these are Gibsons that have a look. We, a lot of us are very familiar with that look. I'm able to somehow simulate that. Uh, some of it gets really difficult. Uh, people send pictures and examples of stuff they want me to reproduce. Uh, their in-house aging has for years reproduced a lot of artists and collectors of choice pieces where a collector will have his guitar reproduced. So the, the things had a life of its own, well, like I said, 20 years. And so, first of all, I feel so fortunate to get to do it. Um, but I'm also really proud of the guitar that exists and still exists today as a historic. I want to say something too that I, I, I am a consultant, but I, I, I mean, my, my authority is very limited, but I have a very close relationship. And at one point, I, I wanted a feature on a guitar that I thought wasn't exactly pleasing to me, especially the carving and the shape of the top. There are many, many things. I, I have always called the, uh, the the concept of the historic, the spinning plates, where the guy in the circus keeps all these different plates spinning. I mean, okay, one year the neck's right, but the carving's wrong, or the, I mean, Edward Wilson handled this for years, where he go, okay, now what do you want us to do? The guitars are so great today, and in 2017, they agreed to make me a guitar. Just, just make it like I like it. And uh, it's so close to being perfect, but just when you just do a couple things, and th they accommodated me. We were going to do 25 of them. It turned into 120. This is, they, they name stuff. I, I don't name it. But this was named, inspired by Tom Murphy. And I, I told them to take my name off of it, please, at some point. But for them, they have to have, have a way to identify it in, in production. So we got through this, and, and they wanted them all aged. So I spent all of the fall and early winter of uh, 2017 into 18 doing these guitars exclusively. So most 
a total fantasy come true for me, but you can also have it because in, in its form it still exists uh, in terms of the carving. That's that's a main thing for me. Uh, the saddles and the bridge and some other things. Uh, and I, I paint them all. Uh, you can buy that guitar. I mean, it's I don't know what it's called today. We had to change the name at some point to keep these limited. Uh, but imagine how fortunate I feel to have that. Now, there's a guitar here. This this guitar is one that I did myself, having bought a used historic, and I actually sort of tweak the carving myself when I strip it off. Uh, I have a buck knife that's really close to the shape of the dish of the carving. And, and what inspired this was I, I told the general manager, I said, okay, every time I do that, some guy wants to pay me a lot of money for it, and then I, I gotta go buy another guitar and do it over again. Why don't you just do it for me? And that's really was the plan, is to sort of do that in production. So, but, but their regular, now I think it's called the Anniversary 59. It's essentially this guitar, or close to it. I mean, when we're talking the shape and the size of the serial number, the color of the back, the feel of the neck, the inlays, the logos, they're still on it. And I don't know if Matt can hear me over there. Matt Taylor, you can go talk to him about that. That's sort of uh, on his plate now. And I think they're really keeping the tradition going. Just, just as a lark. Like I said, we kept the secret for a long time. And then one time visiting the Japanese, who are so intrigued by this and, and have received it so well, I just went, okay, here. That's how I do it. That, that's the stuff I use, okay? I mean, there's no... That's a railroad spike. Here are my car keys. This was the... That's the key to my old S10 pickup truck, right there. Okay. The original belt buckle is long gone after hundreds of guitar. There's what's left of the cowboy and the cow off the belt buckle from that first buckle I used to do the treatment on the back. And if you look at these guitars, you'll see some of that. Now, along the way, this was used to do the Joe Perry. The Joe Perry fingerware, if you've ever seen that guitar, it's got a really deep gouge on the, on the uh, bridge volume control. So you put this on there, and you put this piece, and just go round and round and round and round and round until it makes that big groove. And so, when you look at a piece, you go, gosh, what caused that? Or what can cause it repeatedly? Because, understand, we may do 150 of these in a run. And so, you have to figure a way to do it every time. We, we had templates. Uh, there's the Gary Moore guitar back here, the finger where uh, Edwin did a lot of the research on most all of these, from the Jimmy Page all the way through the Greedy uh, Gary Moore guitar. But this fingerware, I have a notebook full of pictures and the templates you make out of a clear sheet and then you cut them out and put them on the guitar so you can reproduce the, the same shape every time. This is freehand here. I had no templates for it. Then when they went into production, I had to make templates, but I did this guitar from scratch. But, um, you know, so, yeah, and I'm mean, even passing around. But uh, I guess just to wrap it up, uh, still today, like when the guy asked me what I do, this is what I do, and this is how it happened. Uh, years and years of being involved in this culture here. Uh, there was a deception uh, element or issue. There was a time when people thought I might be well, I'll say this. A guy said, man, that's really cool. That's awesome. The next day he goes, dude, you got to do something. I almost bought that guitar as original. That was a big compliment, really. 